Um, yeah, so thanks for the organising committee to inviting me to speak today. I originally, on the program, um, well, when they first came to me, they wanted me to talk about agronomy issues related to varieties. So I thought it'd be fairly simple, but it turned out once I started doing it, it wasn't actually that simple. But, um, and they also asked Justin Kudnig to speak mainly because some of the work that he had done on population work and blacklegs. So it was totally unrelated to um, the seed sales thing. But when I got through doing my talk, I didn't really need Justin, so I've given him the flick. <laughs> and, um, hope he, but he's there to answer any sort of tricky questions, which I hope there aren't going to be any. So um, the agronomic issue, I rang around last year, at the end of last year, just um, to quite a few agros and consultants that I know just asking them what the issues were and, and they all came up with the, you know, the dry sowing was, a, was quite a big issue last year, no subsoil moisture and the, the duress the farmers were under with low prices, um, it was quite a major, major issue and then, um, so that's probably one where I can relate varieties to and that's what I'm going to talk about mostly. The aphids was a, aphid thing was a lot of farmers got caned by aphids and so I'm going to touch on that, I can't really touch on, on variety interactions because we, we spray all our NVTs and control the aphids. So, but I know from work that I've done with lupins in the past and, and other crops that um, there is varietal differences in susceptibility to aphids. But, um, so I'm just going to, I won't be able to bring varieties into it too much, but I'm just going to, I'll go through some of the um, parameters that I look at when I'm um, deciding to whether to spray for aphids. The dim resistance, a lot of, a lot of uh, consultants and agronomists you know, mentioned that it was uh, an emerging issue and certainly from the, um, the surveys that ARI have done at, here in Perth that, um, you know, that they're, they're, I think from 2003 to 2010 there was a 57% increase in um, ryegrass populations that are either resistant or developing resistance so, to, to ryegrass. So I think um, that was an issue that would, you know, certainly in the last two years growers have re I've seen more of and I can relate that to varieties because there is the new, you know, um, TT hybrid with the Roundup trait coming in. It won't be available this year, but it'll be available next year. Canola breeders and PAC have both working on that technology. I've done work for both of them. So I'll touch on that a little. I did a quite a detailed talk last week at the Global Herbicide Resistance Challenge, but I'll just pull out a few slides from that. The black leg thing is an emerging issue, of course, and um, I won't go into too much detail there because I keep in contact with Steve Marcroft uh, Who's, who runs the National Black Leg Screening Program and we do the trials for him in WA or some of the trials and, so, and they're, they're obviously starting to, not everyone's starting to agree on the Black Leg thing so I thought I'd better keep out of that but there is some issues there that I'll bring up and also performance of varieties from um, the various seasons so a lot of the agroers were wondering how you can compare them so they're the sort of main issues that, that we came up with. So today I'm going to, I'll recap on last year and it's quite interesting looking at last year's temperatures compared to the previous two years. Probably last year was more similar to 2010 than 2011 which highlights how difficult it is to compare varieties from one season to another. Um, so I'll look at, just quickly look back at some of those yields in 2010 and then um, I did a grain yield analysis by, by rainfall. I just plotted the site means um, of all the different trials against the uh, rainfall and come up with some interesting stuff. So I'll show that. And that's quite, it's interesting because it is interrelated to the herbicide resistance thing and the dry sowing thing because of the amount of subsoil moisture that's out there this year. It could give us an opportunity to probably change some of the variety selections we, you know, that we're after. And then I'll talk briefly about aphids and black egg and then if I have enough time I'll talk about the new TTRR canola. So this is a um, a chart of the temperature graph. It looks like a lot there, but if you just look at the, the top line in the purple is the, is the max for 2012, the lighter colour is the max for 2011, and they, they sort of mirror each other. There's a few little blips in it. But the bottom one's interesting, and that's the minimums. And if you look at the, the minimum temperatures, you know, you've got that, we had a, a rainfall event in early May, and then it got really warm. So that's the red line going skywards, you know, up to about 17 degrees. And that had quite big implications for growers because anyone who, who's so dry got that, lucky to get that 12 or 14 mil on it, they got up and got a nice strike, whereas if you were sown into it, it dried out very quickly and the establishment um, wasn't as good. And then the temperatures went fairly low. And then if you have a look at that July period, which is the other interesting one, is that the divergence there 
at the minimums from last year compared to 2010. 2010 was an extremely warm year. Look at that light coloured line. Right through from May to early August, there was no days below zero. And whereas last year there was 17. So it was vastly different. And then when you look at how you analyse varieties and compare them from one year to another, it makes a huge difference. You've got rainfall interaction as well. So um, I thought I'd show that. It's, and then you get into your spring patterns where you get rainfall events and then it's warming up and um, cooling down. The other one last year was that spike in temperature in the end of September. That's the purple dark coloured line up in September on the top in the max. And um, unfortunately I think we'll be seeing a, probably a bit more of that. So if you look at that compared to 2010, so the 2011 is the blue again, so that's the warm temperatures in the minimum from June to August, and then 2010 is the orange line on the bottom, where you can see it kicking down there below zero, and there was about 20 days of zero or less in 2010. So, so the, my point is that when you're comparing varieties one year to another, it's very difficult for a lot of reasons, and last year was extremely difficult to compare to 2011. So I'm going to quickly look at the 2010 data. I spoke at the crop updates then, and I'll just quickly scan through them, and just so you can see what the varieties that went well in 2010 were. They're a bit funky, these graphs, because I had to get them off old slides and stick them on that background. But So Eridu, um, most of you know those varieties. Minginu, the, the, the roundups, the, the 404 was near the top. Um, uh, there's Eclipse, which is a canola breeder line that was up near the top, and then three canola breeder lines that were had adaptation to the north. And some of those aren't, I don't even know if they're sold anymore, some of those. Then Williams Crusher up near the top, and Cobbler. Notice that Cobbler's down at the bottom of pretty well all of them in 2010. Catanning, 404 up near the top. Um, Taipan, I'm not even sure if that's sold anymore, or the Pioneer line. And then Crusher up at the top, and Canola Britta's Jardie has gone, did quite well in that year. Arthur River, Stingray, you all heard of, Jardie, Crusher. Um, and Barker, 404, I don't think, I'm not sure if Mustang sold any more than Crusher and Cobbler. So, uh, oh, Scadden, same deal, all those varieties you'd know. Stingray, uh, 444, I don't think sold any more. Fighters, not Juni, Snapper, and Scadden, and then Cobbler down at the bottom. One thing just to keep in mind, because I'll be talking about later, is um, Cobbler. And Cobbler at Barker um, in 2010, none of the NVTs had a fungicide under them. And we were noticing this in farmers' crops probably three to four years ago, that Cobbler was starting to crash for blackleg, particularly that got pushed into the higher rainfall zones. And certainly, I think that's what's happening there. Um, so in summary, I think those, the 2010 year, you could, a lot of those varieties are the major varieties grown now. And even though we've got a lot of new varieties coming through, and so that's probably the year, if you do want to go back and have a look at some of that data, that's probably a good year to look at compared to what happened last year. So that's us dry sowing up at Arano on the, about the 28th of May or something. It was pretty disgusting. I think when we finished that, that was a wheat site. Everyone legged it. I couldn't see. <laughs> they all took off straight away. It was just filthy. It was hot and windy. There was no subsoil moisture at all. And prices weren't too good. And there was a lot of negative sentiment in the rural community. And that was the sort of situation that farmers were faced with at the start. And um, we had some breeder sites we were going to put in up there, but we, we dragged them to further south because of the prospects of that year. And so what I did is I had a look at the... I plotted the growing season rainfall, so it's effective growing season rainfall from last year, against the site means. So what each one of those little blue dots is a site from 2012 and they, just of the TT varieties, they include all the hybrids and all the OPs. And so it's the site mean. And I just plotted against effective growing season rainfall. So I got the May to September rainfall, and I added a factor in for out of season rainfall, which there's some good calculators around. And it was interesting, the relationship that I got. I mean, that R squared's pretty high. Anything above eight's pretty good, or 0.8, and that's 0.91, and, um, which means a good relationship between the rainfall and the yield. And I did this across a heap of years and it was incredibly similar. And um, so the point there is that if you, were, um, if you were down around 100 mils of effective growing season rainfall last year, things weren't too good. You know, you could go anywhere between 0.4 to 0.8 tonne in your canola. And then but once you got up to 150, you started to, you're up around that 1.25 tonne mark. And then as soon as you got up to 200, you were starting to make a bit of money. And, um, 
So that's actual data, and it's probably skewed down the bottom. You know, it could be, because it's mean data from each site, it includes the best um, TT hybrids, and it includes cobra and all those old varieties as well. So it's, it's probably understating the potential there. Then if you compare that to the, T, the Roundups, the Roundup did exactly the same thing with all the Roundup sites, and the first thing you notice is the slope is a bit flatter. The, the Y is 0.90, and here's 110, so that slope's steeper, and the, the Roundup slope is flatter, which means that um, at the same rainfall, you get a higher yield. And again, that was incredibly repeatable from one year to the other when I had a look at it. And um, again, what it showed, if you're down below around that 100 mils, you're, it, things aren't too good. You don't, you don't, canola's not really a, a good prospect. But as soon as you get up to 150, you know, you're, you're up around 1.45 tonnes. So if you compare that to the TT, 1.25, the same rainfall, 1.45 for the roundups. So 200 kilo kick just from growing a roundup. They're hybrids, of course. They're, but in that data, there is some OPs, like um, Cobra, and they're skewing the data probably down a bit. So if anything, it's understating that as well. So at every single site, except for, uh, except for one, the roundups were higher yielding than all the TTs. Now, the reason I mention that is because the amount of subsoil moisture we've got um, this year available, in a lot of areas it's, it's probably going to be equal to about 30 mils in the end of April. So um, depending on the intensity of the rainfall events and when they occurred, there's big chunks of the eastern wheat belt and areas that didn't have subsoil moisture last year do this year. And if you can start your year off with 30 mils in the ground, you've only got to get 120 mils and you'll get a crop. So it changes dramatically your decisions on what you probably could be doing. And if you look at the, the top yielding TT varieties last year versus cobbler, you see there in every situation where there are sort of low yielding sites, the cobbler was down at the bottom, and it was down at the bottom by a fair way. And the cobbler was, you know, anything up to 400 kilos lower than the top TT. And there's a good mix of um, hybrids, all the ones with HT are hybrids, and the things like Stapper and Gem, Stingray are, and Telfer are, and OPs, so a bit cheaper seed. But the point there is that at one of our MVT advisory committee meetings um, last year, someone had some uh, delivery data from 2011, and I think close to 40% of deliveries in 2011 were cobbler. And it's because cobbler is a cheap system. It's an OP, you can retain your seed, and you can sow it. It doesn't cost you a lot up front, and you can sow it, and then um, if you get some, you know, in years that you want to sow it. But the point here is that if you've got retains, if you've got cobbler that you're going to sow this year where you've got potential for high yields, you're, going to, you're really keeping, you know, putting a lid on the potential yield you could get. And so in a lot of those areas, you might be better off going for a variety with a high yield potential. And then if you look at the, the same, the top yielding TTs in the mid to low rainfall region, so these are slightly higher yield levels, um, same thing. It it's, it's mirrors, you know, you've got anything from 200 kilos to 500 kilos difference from cobbler to the best, best TT varieties you could, the, um, from the yields from last year. And again, you've got a mix of TTs, uh, OPs and hybrids. And you've got, at these high yield levels, you've got some other varieties like 559, Crusher, uh, Sturt's a good one. It's a new one from Canola Breeze that's a, a ripper of a variety and it's, it suits um, the lower, probably medium rainfall. Uh, you've got Gem, you know, Jardy, a few others. And if you compare that to the, to the roundups, this is actually quite interesting in itself. In the roundups, um, pretty at Eridu, Kalingri, Corridge and Cunderdon and Bunteen, those three varieties were all the top varieties. Those 404, Y23 and GT41, there was, wasn't anything in it at all. And if you can, um, so that's interesting in itself. That the, uh, those, and they're all hybrids. And they, um, so as far as if, you do, if you're looking at, say, a, what a lot of growers said to the agros last year was they would like to put a roundup in, you know, on their farm in those low rainfall areas. And they haven't really had the opportunity in the past because it's been too risky. The seed's expensive and there wasn't any subsoil moisture. But this year there may be an opportunity to grow a, a roundup ready hybrid and with less risk. And I put cobra in there because cobra is an OP and it just shows where the yield difference is going with those hybrids. Um, so the main points from that are that the, 
last year, um, at, a, at a 150 mils, if you grew a TT, and that's average data, remember, it includes all the, 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 the good um, hybrids and the IPs, there was um, predicted yield, or the actual yield was 1.25 tonnes, and for, for the roundups, it was 200 kilos more. And um, so, uh, in all cases, the best TTs were, were more than 200 kilograms higher yielding than cobbler, and a combined average is 24% higher. And uh, in all but one site, the roundups were at least 10% at least higher than the TTs, and a combined average is 36% higher than cobbler. So, if there was ever a year that, um, if you have got some cash and if you, you know, um, and you have got some subsoil moisture, it, it could be a year where you could. Um, where you could be, could be better off growing at some, you know, some of these newer varieties rather than, say, cobbler. Um, that's a, just a photo of one of our sites that's near Darren, and that's a, that's a hybrid in the, with the yellow tag, and there's some non-hybrids next to them. That just showed the difference in emergence that you can get from a hybrid, and um, it was, that, was, you know, that, was quite, that was evident pretty well you know, in most areas of the state. Now, there's a lot of data there, but the, I put it up because this is the top TT varieties in the high rainfall regions, and those, none of those varieties are significantly different at each site. They, are, they sort of are down the bottom end, but I put them in there. I put a few of those bottom ones in there just to show you. But I suppose the, the, the point from last year is that um, at, a, at a range of sites, there's, there's some, you, you, you're sport for choice. You know, in those, in those medium to high rainfall zones. A lot of those varieties, and there's not a lot different in them. They have some slight regional adaptation differences, which I won't go into at the moment, but certainly some companies' varieties suit some areas and some varieties suit some areas more than others. But in a general sense, there wasn't a lot in those top five to seven varieties last year. So for growers, they've got a lot of choice. And then, you know, the, the other interesting thing is you can see that the hybrids are, the, are, kicking, are up, sort of floating to the top. And in most cases, even though they're not significantly different, most of the hybrids are up near the top. And I think what we'll see is, particularly in the medium to high rainfall zones, that, that, in, that can tend to continue. Um, and again, the, the other, some other sites, um, same thing. You know, you've got some of the... Um, what was the difference in the other one? Yeah, so they're, they're the really high-yielding sites, and these are the sort of... Um, slightly lower yielding sites, but the same deal. They're not significantly different, and, and you've got some different varieties coming in there that are, you know, like your IH50s, your GT50, some of the new ones are, you know, up near the top. The Y22, some of those Pioneer lines are excellent that are coming through the Roundup lines. Um, so that's, that's on the variety thing. The, um, I thought I'd put in the thing about the aphids because it was such a big issue last year and it is related to the low rainfall guys. If, if, um, if I'm going to be spending sort of 40 or $50 worth of seed this year, so in a roundup to try and clean up a paddock, I don't want to lose 200 kilos again from aphids. And I think when I looked at the recommendations, um, well, when I was speaking at field days in the spring, it was, there was a lot of questions about the aphids and I went through what I do and how I determine you know, when I should spray and and the threshold levels. And the threshold levels I use are probably a fair bit lower than what's recommended. And so I went through our database from the thir last 13 years at AgriSearch and pulled, we'd, we'd done about 90 something trials over that time in WA on aphids. We harvested about a third of them. And um, in every case, there was a yield benefit from spraying the aphids. Now, it's skewed a bit because we picked spots where the, the canola population is not as dense, so we can spray and get through it. So we're probably skewing it in the lower end, and also we look for populations that are going to take off, so we can get yield differences. But I, um, the, the recommendation is 20% uh, percent of plants infected with aphids, and I just—it's a really weird recommendation because if you try and walk through a, a field of canola and pick out heads and look at the look at the buds, you've got to have sort of quite a few aphids there before you can see them. You know, so if you're looking at turnip aphid, you, might, you need probably half a dozen before you can actually see if they're there. And um, very hard for a grower to rationalise what to do because the, the actual, they're not stipulated time is and when you should spray either. So what I've done is I've just put in this out there and this is what I do. Um, that plot there is a plot of canola that's what we call 50% first flower. That's when we do our flowering notes. So it's when 50% of the plants have got a first flower. And 
it's quite easy to get your eye in on that. You watch your canola when it comes up, and you can, that's quite a quantitative measure you can look at. And about a week after that is when I do a good check on, with a sweep net. And if you get more than 50 aphids, then you spray. So if you've got, and, and I reckon a sweep does about a square metre, so 10 sweeps is 10 square metres, 30 plants per square metre, about 300 plants. So my threshold is probably five times less than what the recommendation is. And it's probably about a week earlier than what, they, what people would generally would spray, maybe even two weeks. Um, so, you know, um, I haven't... Yeah. So I haven't got any you know, data. It's only, it's only backed up with 90 trials but, and experience, but I think um, there could be some scope to review the aphid story a little. And um, I think the reason I've got it in here is I think for growers, um, you're looking for low risk, and I think if you're going to um, try to get a decent yield in your canola in the eastern wheat belt where you've got some subsoil moisture, I would, you don't want to lose, and you could easily, because it's that those yield levels sort of one tonne, 1.2 tonnes or less, is where you're going to have the problems because you get drought and you get those dry, dry spells in the spring and the aphids really can take hold very quickly. So I'd be um, advising growers in those regions to, to, to check their aphids populations with a sweep net and um, based on those recommendations and spray if necessary. Um, this is just a bit on the black leg. That's one of our black leg indi indicator trials at Cogenup and just shows you there's a junts here in the middle there. Um, that's what they look like. They're, they're, they have no fungicide treatment. We have them alongside MVTs that have fungicide treatment. That's the photo on the left is the, the treated, a treated plot. I think that's cobbler um, with impact. And you can see, might be a bit hard, but the, the spots on the older leaves and the untreated, you can see clearly that it's getting, getting banged up or getting hammered by aphid, by spore infection. And that's the same plot at the... Uh, at the end of the season, so the untreated is all falling over and the cobbler that's treated is standing up. Now the point of putting that in there is that over the last um, few years you can see Crusher at the top, you know, since 2010 was a major, you know, it was a, quite a major variety then, it still is. So it's into its third or fourth year of quite large plantings. I suspect, I don't know what the delivery of Crusher is, but I suspect it's be well over 20% now of the state. So in areas where you're growing Crusher you're, you're at risk of um, falling over with blackleg because the, the um, build-up of isolates in the, in the regional areas where the, where the crusher is grown is starting to get at probably critical levels. And so I'd definitely be treating with probably impact or something, you know, a, a fertiliser, um, fungicide-treated fertiliser, which are more effective than the seed-treated um, seed fungicides. And so, again, that's one that just, you know, without getting into the black leg story too you know, too technically, that was just a comment that I'd like to make from last year on agronomic sense. Um, now, just quickly on the, the dual herbicide tolerant canola, this is a, a trial we did for Pacific Seeds in conjunction with Monsanto. We did some efficacy trials um, looking quite detailed look at, at weed control and yield. So this is a population, that's a final population, started around about 40 plants per square metre of, of ryegrass, and that's um, two application of Roundup. And that's a select treated plot. So I've got about 90% control in the, from the select. And, and I won't go through, the, there's just a couple of points I want to get out of this data because there's, it's quite, there's quite a lot of interactions there. But the first one is, and this is related to this year for growers who maybe can't afford a Roundup Ready hybrid and they're finding, getting you know, levels of dim resistance, they're not getting good select control. The treatment to the Nutrazine. 2.2 kilos at four leaf, you notice there that the ryegrass control is about 78%. And when, I, when Joe brought this in, I thought there was a mistake. I thought she must have been having a snooze or something. But when we went and had a look at it, it, she was spot on. And when I looked through, I got the girls to look through some old discs I had from 97 and the late 90s, and we were getting exactly the same thing when we were doing our original work with TT Canola. And you can see there, if you go to six leaf, you, um, the ryegrass control falls off a bit due to the competition, but the point is that I think a lot of growers have forgotten that. Because their selectives have worked so well, they forget what the impact that atrazine can have on contributing to ryegrass control. And um, so if you can't afford a Roundup, you know, in a paddock, and you want to, you know, but, and you stood your face with, say, having to grow a triazine, um, you're in an area where you can't grow um, propazamide or um, spray. I, I think the registration is coming through this year, but that's more suited in the southern areas. 
you still you should be looking at putting those high doses of, and I wouldn't recommend 2.2, I'd be saying more like 1.6 kilos, so it's a 90G active uh, formulation, and with your select, and you'll, um, you may not get your 98% control, but it'll still help out with the select. But it, it is something to think of in, the, in 2014 when these other TT Roundup hybrids are available. Um, yeah. The other, just a quick one on the, if you just look at treatment four and five, just the, the ryegrass control only went from 92 to 98% and we still got a couple of hundred kilos on yield. Now that's something that a lot of people don't realise is that just getting that final bit of control and the, you know, it can have a big impact on yield as well. So that RT means the dual, that was the dual tolerant, um, the, the, the TT hybrid with the Roundup Ready trait. Um, and there's a, t there's a straight TT. You can see the same sort of thing with the, with the atrazine. And there's the straight Roundup system. So that's, a, that's 404 RR. And you can see the high levels of control you get from two applications. And then the select there, about 90% control. <coughs> Um, anyway, the main points are the atrazine thing, you know, really probably take away for this year. So, anyway, in summary, those were the sort of things that I got out of last year. And, um, yeah, and so I suppose in a few minutes for any questions. Thanks, Michael. We've got five minutes for questions, if anybody's got questions. Hi, Michael. Ty Fullwood, grower. Uh, my question is with regards to your guidelines for uh, aphid sampling and decision making. Is that based on a cost benefit analysis? We just found that we, we can damage the crop a fair bit with our self propelled sprayer and the cost of actually spraying it. And then th that tends to make our decision a lot more difficult. I'm just wondering whether your guidelines are based on. Well, I mean, I suppose. So I think. Oh, just so you're asking whether the recommendation includes the the benefit over the cost of the application. Yeah, the, I'm just talking straight benefit, okay? How many kilos of yield? You know, and the yield is the lowest we got was 50 or 40 kilos, and that was January we had rain and the, it knocked the populations around. But they are regularly 200 kilos to plus, you know, in a 1.2 tonne crop. So you can do your own calculations on your 300 plus 300, you know, of SP and OP, which is a general, what you're probably using, are you? Uh, what what you don't, you don't use, you don't spray for aphids, or? Yes, yeah. But what would you use? Pardon? I'm not sure. Yeah. So my, I, think, I suppose probably a farmer rate is, is 200, 300 of an SP and 300 of an OP, and that's maybe $6, plus your $8 or whatever to spray it. So I think there's definitely worth spraying at that, those sort of costs. Any more questions? It's hard to see that There's line. one over here. Uh, in terms of the variety selections, uh, we noticed that canola is uh, uh, interacted with the environment significantly compared with wheat. This morning we had, uh, a, even in wheat, you have a uh, strong uh, environment and uh, cultivar uh, interactions. In terms of that, what do you uh, make about uh, the recommendation for different uh, from higher rainfall zone to lower rainfall zone in terms of cultivar selections? Mm. Um. Just, just sort of, I, can't, I couldn't quite get it, sorry. What, yeah, well, what I mean, they, uh, in canola, yeah. and uh, environment and the, the cultivar interaction is much more stronger than wheat. But, sorry, and, what is more stronger? The, oh, uh, oh, okay, yeah, right, yep, okay. And in terms of recommendation based on, uh, I mean, you, I know you presented only one year results, but uh, if overlooking for uh, many years of MVG trials, and I think, uh, what, uh, what do you, can you elaborate a little bit more on cardiovascular selections for different regions? Yeah, I, I'm not sure. What do, what do you reckon? I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure. I mean, I think the question is cultivar selections for different regions. Oh, okay. Like specific regions or, yeah. Um, oh, God. Um, whew, I don't know. I mean, I'm not really sure if you're asking how you determine cultivar selection for region adaptation. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Um, I just yield. Look at yield. I mean, there's things like um, uh, how, how varieties respond to day length and temperature, and what the breeders do is they'll place their material north and south to get the, the temperature interaction to see how stable they are, 
They also look at the, the um, day length, you know, longer days in the north, and to see how stable they are. And some varieties have more stability under temperature and, and day length. Is that what you're sort of asking, or not really? Per so, sorry, perhaps you could follow that up. Yeah. In, in a, in <laughs> sorry, a... I couldn't. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'll talk um, to you later. Michael will be at the speaker's corner uh, after at the break, so perhaps follow it up there.